This is What's Next. I'm host Thomas O'Neill White, and this week we are taking a look back, a look forward, and a look at the here and now with regard to the tragedy of May 14th, where 10 people were murdered and three others wounded during a racist attack at the Tops Friendly Markets on Jefferson Avenue. This event has galvanized the area, but more specifically, Buffalo's black community on the east side. And joining me today is author and activist Mark Talley, who lost his mother, Geraldine, on that faithful day. Uh, Mark, thank you for being with us today. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Uh, we're coming up on, on two years since the top shooting, and I just wa- I wanted to ask you a personal question what, right off the bat. Where are you physically, emotionally? mentally spiritually i'm pretty good uh you know i'm working working on getting back to shape physically but i'm almost there but you know i'm okay is it like is you are you taking it day by day week by week month by month uh, just <laughs> day by day day by day how, how do you how did you approach the the anniversary 514 anniversary last year I prepare for the circus. You know, it is what it is. I knew it was going to be a lot of, a lot of commotion onto it. Um, a lot of people trying to make money off of it, selling five fourteen shirts. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people trying to get, uh, you know, their pictures taken. Um, a lot of people just trying to make money off a of tragedy. How do you navigate that? It is what it's it is. Being 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 personally affected by it. I just got to keep my blinders on, try not to let rage overcome me and hurt somebody. I just try to keep, um, try to stay in that 40, 60 range. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you talk to family members? Do you talk to other people about, about the, these people, interlopers is what I'd like to call them. Who, who come in and try to make a buck off this tragedy. Do you, do you ex- explain your, your fears about that to them? How do you, how do you, how do you get that, or get, provide that outlet? I really uh, don't talk to anybody about it. I mean, you know, when I try to talk to people, when I tell people what the Buffalo Bills did, they, uh, they say, oh man, that's, that's sad, that's wrong. And then a week later, they're preaching the Buffalo Bills. So there's there's no point to talk that people won't listen. Mm-hmm. And for those who don't know, what did what did the Buffalo Bills do that that you felt was in the wrong? All right, homeowner against home opener against the Los Angeles Rams. You know, just not not tried to call it what it is, but they wouldn't listen. They was trying to market off the families to get some promotion on their home opener. They wanted us to wear those in, in hate, choose love, stop racism shirts. I said I didn't want to wear it. I prefer to either wear my organization hoodie or just a regular T-shirt. They told me, no, you have to wear this or you can't be on the field. I said I wasn't going to wear it. So they kicked me off the field um, while everybody else got to stay on the field for the tribute. How did that make you feel? It is what it is. When you, when you expect the worst from people, organizations, and society, uh, it's hard for you to get late, let down when you're already expecting it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how are you approaching this two-year anniversary? Preparing for the circus again. You know, once again, the spotlight will be back on for 514 you know, probably those 514 shirts would be out again, people trying to sell it, people once again trying to, you know, get a get a quick picture in, try to be on the news, try to be on the radio. I just try to stay in my 4060 range, do the work that uh, that I've been focused on doing. Uh outside of of us here at WBFO, have you have you gotten a, um calls for for interviews and and that such photo ops and all, all that stuff? Oh yeah, some calls, um, you know, coming up regarding stuff, uh, you no, know, that's trying to be done around five fourteen. So, in your opinion, has progress been made in this area um, with regard to race relations in this region? Um, obviously, there's still a lack of grocery stores on the east side. 
um, racial equity in general. Whoa. From your viewpoint, and because you've been right in the middle of it ever since 514, what do you think about progress in this area? No progress is being made. I mean, the east side of Buffalo, what it was on May 13th, it still was on May 15th and close to two years afterwards. Housing is still probably the biggest issue right now. Drugs, poverty, lack of education, uh, and unfortunately, it's just no money, no funding available, or it's no money to be given to the east side of Buffalo, an area that really needs it. So what's preventing this money from coming in? Because as, as you know, a week later, after 514, we had politicians from all over the place talking about, and, and business leaders from around the area talking about, well, we need to do this for the east side. We need to do that for the east side. We're going to get this money coming in, and it's going to help uh, bring up these neighborhoods on, on Buffalo's east side. What's prevented that from happening? Where are they going to get the money from? I mean, you know, America doesn't want to have a conversation with itself that reparations is probably needed. I mean, I know you know, Mayor Byron Brown probably wants to put a lot of money back into the east side of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. No, I truly believe him after personal conversations with him. But where is he going to get the money from? I know Kathy Hochul, you know, she did give the $10 million uh, the grant, I believe, to the east side of Buffalo. But, you know, that that's money that will be beneficial to the people 10 years from now. And right. I don't think that money is going to help the people currently that needs it. You know, people – majority elderly residents staying in their house in which, you know, their rent is probably close to $2,000 a month and which is probably about to get raised now due to increased housing prices and they can barely afford that. So what you're saying is we need, we need money to be put in the hands of the people. Yes. And have the people make their decision, make the decisions on, on what to do with it, well, in the community. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's been two years. We we know the issues here in Buffalo. We know the problems. We know what we could do to fix it. We're just not doing it. Like, we're all talking about it. Now, I remember I, I, I immediately said after 514, uh, you know, I'm getting tired of talking about 514. I want to go to step two. But it seems like we're still on step one talking about 514 and why it happened. Mm -hmm. And so what is step two? Step two, obviously, progress. But where does that start? Let's initiate a plan to help the east side of Buffalo relating to education, relating to housing, relating to poverty. And let's just start. No, we're not even all coming together to jot down ideas on how we can get funding, how we can get this money, how we can get it into the hands of the people who really need it. So we're still in some ways siloed in what we want to do and need to do for this community. I know some of the people I've talked to said, say, you know, they're working on their things and they said, yes, well, we're working with these groups because the more, the more we work together, obviously, the better we'll be. I know that's a <laughs> cliche to, to some degree, but, but. The breaking down of these silos uh, within the city, within nonprofits, uh, you know, within for profits, um, is is happening to some degree. But you're not. But you're saying it's not happening uh, quickly enough, or or powerfully enough. I'm saying um, it's not happening quickly, if not happening at all. And you know, I can kind of know why it's it's not hard to see that probably the east side of buffalo is preparing you know getting ready to be you know the jefferson area in particular uh getting ready to be gentrified and you can see you know the the buying of houses buying a property trying to raise up the rent prices to kick all the people that's currently in these houses out um you know you got the 33 you know the whole highway highway situation with the Department of Transportation happening. Mm -hmm. You kind of see the writing on the wall of what's happening. Yeah. And it's like the community is helpless because we can't do anything about it. 
What are your thoughts on the Kensington Expressway and what in and, and the Department of Transportation's plans for it? Uh, we're 10 years too late to have the conversation about it. You know, either option is a lose-lose. The option to not have it built in the first place, you know, we're 10 years too late. If we don't build it, then the people that's coming from the, you know, faraway suburbs, they're just going to move in, buy these houses up so they can be closer to their workplace. Um, or if they do build it, you know, a lot of probably environmental consequences for the people in the area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to be all down and out because there are some things happening, some things that are moving forward that are good. The civil suits moving forward um, against gun manufacturers and social media companies um, and also the the 514 Memorial Commission um, what do you know anything? What do you know about the, the 514 Memorial Commission? I've been talks uh, with the 514 Memorial Commission with, um, you know, Reverend Mark Blue, Garnell Whitfield. Uh, they're keeping me informed and updated. Um, I personally really don't have have any opinion about it. Um, I definitely be, believe in both both of their opinions and jurisdiction on what they believe was right. Mm-hmm. I gave my opinion on what I would like, but you know, for myself personally, I like the, you know, the, the community memorial that uh, artist I believe John Fredericks did across from Tops with the Doves. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about your book, The Day the Devil Came to Buffalo. It's been out for about a year. Oh uh, yes. Um. Yeah, I've been I've been reading through it, and I was I was really struck by the 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 little personal details about you and your mom, like even going back to to when you were pretty young. Um, very very detailed about your conversations and and all of that. Um, so through through your book, how do you how do you want your audience? your reading audience to see your mother, Geraldine. I want the audience to see her the last way I saw her. And, you know, that that was having a semi-automatic shotgun pointed at her in which the two two bullets shot her on the side of the head. That's how I want the audience to see her because that's the pain I have to live with you know, all the time, I want people to remember that this is the effects that gun violence can have. This is the effects that uh, systemic racism can have. What's been your experience in the two years since the shooting? Um, you've 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 sort of been unwittingly thrust into this spotlight. Um, I guess I would, <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't say, if I didn't ask you if there was still anger within you regarding the shooter, um, how do you, how do you manage that anger? It's a lot of anger, um, a day by day basis. Sometimes I want to just start screaming. Um, some days I want to scream, but just can't scream. Uh, I find I find solace knowing I get to hear my mother's voice here and there in my dreams. But regarding regarding the shooter, you know, from firsthand knowledge, I know eventually he won't make it to his day of death. In your dreams, and I know that's 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 you talk about this in your book. What does your mom tell you? Oh, you guys have conversations. Oh, it's it's really nothing, nothing poetic, nothing no. spiritual. Just just random stuff. I had a dream we were trick or treating in Candyland one time. <laughs> I had a dream we were picking up Jada Kiss from the airport. Oh yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a bunch of random stuff. Oh, that's well. I mean, I guess keeping that, being able to hear her voice again has got to be powerful. You know, to is it. You have the dream and you wake up, is that 
Does that motivate you in the morning? I think my dreams is the way to let my emotions come out because I'm a kind of a non-emotional person um, outside of my dreams. Mm-hmm. Which kind of gets which gets people put in a conundrum because I say I'm you no know, kind of introverted, don't like being around people, non-emotional. Then you know they say, well, look at all the stuff you're doing for people. So that's kind of hard hard to explain. <laughs> well, let's talk about the work you are doing for for people, agents of advocacy. What's that all about? All right, just my uh, organization to spread awareness against systemic racism and socioeconomic inequality so we can foster a reality in which one's race, one's environment shouldn't dictate one's future. Hey, you work with other groups locally? Oh, yeah, we've... At this point, it's easier to name the people who I haven't worked with. But yeah. uh, some of the more larger organizations, Roswell, ECMC, EY, um, the Sabres Foundation, the Buffalo Sabres, they've been a, a tremendous support of me. Uh, so definitely a special thank you to Tyler Ford and Rich, Rich Jeweler of the Sabres Foundation. Uh, they've been tremendous advocates. Um, M&T, Key Bank, Highmark. Uh, Epic, um, Pastor Giles, Lenny Lane, all all of back to basic ministries. Murray Holman, George mm-hmm. Johnson, Pastor Charles Walker. Um, I'm talking right now to uh, you know, uh, Renato Graham. It's it's a lot of people who I'm probably going to forget. So that's why it's uh-huh. easier easier to name the people who I haven't worked with. But I name I've worked with so many. So now, how do you get like platformed by them and get this message out? All right, basically, um, you know, they help support my events that I do relating to food and equity. Um, I'm getting into maternal health this summer with five events. Uh, my financial literacy classes, um, systemic racism panels, they help me uh, get these speaking engagements either at their companies or other organizations. So it's pretty much, uh, you know, I call them up, let them know this is what my organization, this is what we're going to do. This is the primary results that we want to drive from this event and they just uh they asked me what do i need how can we do to help so you're and you're pretty much touching all all facets of issues affecting uh buffalo's black residents on the east side um Give me a minute. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, where do you see where do you see agents of advocacy in five years? One of the biggest social justice organizations in the state. Like when people think of reform, people think of change. Um, when people think of by by any means necessary approach to combating hatred or inequality. I want them to think of, like, they'll, well, they'll probably think of Miles Carter first, but after Miles, <laughs> think, of, think of Mark Tadley and Agents for Advocacy. Well, ha- knowing both of you, it's pretty good company. <laughs> um, well, in, in doing what you do, has to, ha- you know, you gotta, you gotta have some political backing to do what you do not only i mean you got to have the business backing and everything like that but some political support as well how do you navigate that walking a fine line knowing what to say what not to say you know knowing well if i work with this person this person is kind of enemies of this person so maybe i should work behind the scenes and not in public but you know being behind the scenes with all of these, you know, uh, politicians, nonprofits, um, you know, some of your favorite community leaders, you just see it's kind of a an, an intrigated web that you got to kind of tiptoe across so so you don't hurt people's feelings. You're a big man, but you're also <laughs> pretty nimble, right? <laughs> <laughs> nimble when I want to be. <laughs> um, I know you mentioned... Um, that there actually has not been 
support politically from Governor Kathy Hochul's office. Can you can you get a little bit more into that? I think that I think what she thinks is support is not necessarily support because I know she's putting, you know, ten million dollars on the east side of Buffalo. I just don't think that's going to it's not going to help the people who need it now. It's going to help the people who aren't even in the community right now. So what you would add, if 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 Kathy Hochul was sitting in my seat right now, what would you what would you tell her? What would you ask her? Can we help people on the east side of Buffalo uh, either renovate their renovate their home or help buying their own home? Can we help with you know jobs? And when I say jobs, not you know thirteen dollars and fifty cent jobs with some some real jobs where people can support themselves. Can we help with some type of educational training? Can we help get, you know, people, people unfortunately really don't even know what OSHA certification is, or, you know, can we help these people go to Northland? Can we, can we just do something? Mm-hmm. So saying, you know, we're gonna help the community out, that money won't help the community for another 10 years, and the, that the people in the current community right now will be gone. You know, people need help today with their rent, with their mortgage, with their education, you know, paying back their, you know, student loans. People need help finding a suitable job that could support them and their family. And, you know, that support isn't there. People need fresh groceries. You know, I work a lot with Tops. Uh, I know a lot of the corporate people at Tops. You know, they're doing their best, but... You no, know, having that one grocery store kind of support the entirety of the east side of Buffalo, that is, mm-hmm. that's asking a whole lot. Right. Ha- have have these people at Top said, oh, we're thinking of putting another store in another neighborhood on the east side? Uh, I'll say even if they wanted to, you know, we're at, you know, first they got to find by the land. Most of the land property owners or landowners here in the city, they don't even live in the city. And then mm-hmm. it's going to have to come with development, then construction. So once again, the people who need the groceries now, a new store wouldn't be able to help them. It's going to help the people, you know, in those years. Right. Yeah. So we're talking there needs to be an influx of money right now that will directly, positively impact the people living in the community right now, especially our elders. Absolutely. That and, once again, mainly education. You know, people need to start taking, the school needs to start teaching, you know, financial literacy classes. Um, the schools just need to do a lot better. And unfortunately, you know, there's not that much much funding to go into the schools. Mm-hmm. So, you know, do you blame, you know, Dr. Tanja Williams? Uh, you know, I don't. You know, I believe there's a deficit or funding she has to get rid of, I believe, by $80 million or something. Right. And it's like, you know, she didn't go to that job expecting now she has to cut $80 million, you know, from Buffalo Public Schools when we're already kind of some of the least supported schools. Mm-hmm. So you can only cut till you cut cut too far where you're really not even helping no more and— I believe we passed that point a while ago. Right. And so Asians for Advocacy, you're trying to kind of fill in those gaps, whether it's education or jobs or housing or um, food deserts, just trying to spread yourself in that way. Yeah, just trying to spread spread our message, spread what we do, hopefully connect people to other organizations. You know, I know um, you know my board member Paul, Paul Perez, uh, along with our friend Andrew Scott. You know, I know they have their whole organization, NARAP. They just put on an event this past weekend, I believe, promoting, you know, home 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 businesses, entrepreneurship, real estate. But nonprofits really shouldn't be able to we shouldn't be in a position to have to fill in the gaps that you know, America has put us in. You think uh, it should be for-profits who 
is it is it a for profit organizations and the government that should be doing a lot more of the heavy lifting? Absolutely. No, you you shouldn't have to have a, a Western New York feed more, a feed Buffalo, uh, African Heritage Food Co-op trying to feed, you know, unfortunately, a majority of uh, minority people who need food. Right. And that's or, not to say that they're not doing great things. Yeah, absolutely not to say, but like between feed more feed Buffalo, African Heritage Food Co-op, you know, all the soup kitchens. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, friends of the night people, you know, we're doing more than the government is and for profits are when it comes to, you know, keeping people fed. And I always say being a nonprofit means you're always going to fail because you can never satisfy the need that's out there. So no matter how much food Feed Buffalo gives out, um, uh, friends of the night people, Feed More. African Heritage Food Co-op, you're still going to have people, you know, underneath the expressway, you know, right around here in their camps, you know, mm-hmm. with maybe a slice of pizza crust out the garbage that they're eating. Is that a disheartening feeling to know that as much as you can do is still not enough? Very, especially when you you start seeing the revenue that a lot of the companies here, they're making. Like, when you just look at the profit that they're making and how easily they could, no, not eradicate, but definitely put a, a large dent into the to the food hunger situation and homeless population here. It's, uh, yeah, it's definitely heartbreaking. You do a lot of speaking engagements, as you as you mentioned. Um, what What is, what's the most... I don't know what's what's the uh, what's the most important thing you want your audience to get from one of your speeches. Don't blame don't blame the half knots for having what you have when they were never in a position to have what you have. And what do you can you can you expand on that? Uh, no, nobody poor chooses to be poor. You know, no poor people don't make poor decisions because their first decision wasn't to be poor. You know, somebody automatically born in, let's say, in Williamsville, New York, in the in the five thousand block of Main Street, they're automatically starting off on, you no, know, at least second base compared to somebody that's born on, you no, know, born on High Street or mm-hmm. or Krupp or or Butler, all streets that I I grew up on, you are automatically have a distinct socioeconomic advantage. So it's not for them to say you're poor because of your personal decisions. Absolutely. If you threw if you threw three packs of um three steaks into a cage with five lions, you can't get mad at two lions trying to kill you know, two others so they can be able to eat. Mm. That's a great analogy. That is a great analogy. Um, is there anything that you're looking forward to as the anniversary of 514 approaches? Nothing really, just a, you know, just a Buffalo Black Caucus, um, you know, with Councilwoman Zanetta Everhart that she's planning, our our Blackout Party, as we're calling it, on May 10th, which, uh, once again, that'll be leading up to the Buffalo Black Caucus on May 11th, uh, but we'll come May 14th, uh, just put my blinders on, prepare prepare for all of the BS and just try to stay in my 40 to 60 range until it's over on May 15th. Did you know Zanetta before 514? I want to tell her this in person, but I did know Zanetta. I don't think she remembers this. In 2019, 2020, I was working a telemarketer job 
<laughs> so, Zanetta, if you're listening to this, go on to your LinkedIn messages. <laughs> Look at the very first message I sent you. It should say, hi, I'm Mark Talley from the Aeon Fund. <laughs> I'm, I have uh, these IPOs <laughs> that I'm trying to send, send out to people to buy. And um, as Buffalo's a small place, little did I know uh, two years later we would uh, we would be mourning together. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've you've developed some sort of a relationship with with her son Zaire Goodman, who survived the shooting. Um, how how's that how's that been for you, for the for you? Uh, you know, it's been good. I constantly tell him, you know, um, don't have remorse for that happened that day. You know, you did your job. Your job was supposed to live. Your job was to get out, live, be happy, do what you have to do. You know, you, I tell them all the time, I'm happy that you're here. Yeah, and, and Zanetta's obviously done a lot in this area um, in regards to, to 514. And, and you have as well. Um, I commend you both because it's I I don't know if I'd be able to do it. I'll tell you that much. It's 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 a lot. It's a lot. Um, but I th- I thank you for the work that you're doing right now. Whatever you're going to do in the future, it's always good. One, it's always good to have you here. But it's always good to see you out and about um i think there is personally speaking there is a warmth about you that makes other people gravitate towards you um so i appreciate you for that well thank you i appreciate you for having me here talking to me of course man it would be (laughs) we wouldn't be doing our journalistic duty if we didn't if we didn't have you on again Uh, thank you You're listening to a special episode of What's Next, uh, two years on from the tragedy of May 14th, 2022. I want to thank my guest, Mark Talley, for being with us today. You're listening to WBFO News from Buffalo, Toronto Public Media. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. This is What's Next. I'm host Thomas O'Neill White, and all this week, we are digging into May 14th and the change, or lack thereof, in this region in the two years since the tragedy that claimed the lives of 10 people, injured three more, and started deeper conversations about Buffalo's east side community and the issues which created the environment for the murderer to carry out his plan. Joining me today is political activist and nurse, India Walton. India, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. You've never been a person to hold your tongue, so I, I hope you do not hold it today either. But but my first question is, where are you at emotionally uh, as we approach the anniversary of 514? I am pretty frustrated. In the aftermath, one of the things I said was that I wanted to see what happened when the cameras went away. And as suspected, nothing has materially changed in my neighborhood and the East Side community. And why is that? There's a lot of talking, right? There's mm-hmm. lots of dog and pony shows. There's lots of promises and very little implementation, in my opinion. There's there are. A, there are a litany of socioeconomic issues brought up in the aftermath of this mass shooting, housing, food apartheid, uh, neighborhood divestment, just to name a few. Let's start with, with housing. Are we still having those same conversations from two years ago? Where have we made progress and where have we backtracked? Well, there are plans in the works. I've spoken with, you know, 
some common council members. And, you know, I want to applaud Senator Sean Ryan for his housing package that made it into the state budget this year. However, the people on the ground are feeling the squeeze now. You know, taxes are up. Rents are up and people need relief, not to mention that we have some of the oldest housing stock in the nation. There are issues with lead. There are issues with the sustainability and, you know, insulation or lack thereof in the home. So we still have a very, very long way to go. You mentioned Senator Sean Ryan, the housing bill. For those who don't know, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Senator Ryan has secured, I think, $95 million in the state budget that will go toward protecting renters from eviction, helping small landlords to make repairs to their homes in exchange for long term affordability, which I think is a major step forward, especially since the Buffalo market has been cut out of the good cause um, renter protections that are happening downstate and and also a package that would help um, homes and community renewal be able to build new single and double family homes for ownership opportunities. Now, why was Buffalo cut out? (laughs) <laughs> because there's a clause that takes into account the vacancy rate. And because we have not done a comprehensive vacancy study, um, a lot of what's happening is it seems like there's a high vacancy rate, but we're not taking into account how many units are uninhabitable because you can't live in them because of the condition of the housing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, last time you were on What's Next, you and Jay Moran talked about addressing the affordable housing problem, but it is it is a kind of a tricky situation. It is. And part of my work in the community land trust, right, we talked a lot about development without displacement. What I believe in is that we need mixed income neighborhoods and communities with high amenities, high quality amenities. And what you don't want to do is reconcentrate disadvantage in poverty, right? We mm-hmm. want mixed income neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I want my children to live next door to a teacher or a physician, right? A lot of our neighborhoods, everyone is so poor that that is when you see the conditions of increased crime and things like food apartheid where retailers say, well, there's not the density or there's no market for us to come into this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because we're not attracting a diverse class of people into neighborhoods. And food apartheid obviously was the one of the number one things that was talked about in the aftermath of 514. The tops on Jefferson, the scene of the tragedy remains the only main grocery store, major grocery store on Buffalo's east side. How does that sit with you? It's been two years. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that if our elected officials were serious about changing anything, then it would have happened by now. I can count on one hand the number of times I've been in that store in two years. And every time I go in there, I feel guilty. I feel a sense of guilt because I don't have to go there. Right. Mm -hmm. And you've got options. I don't frequent the store because I don't have to. Right. Mm -hmm. I can get in my car. I can go to Wegmans. I can go to Whole Foods. I can order Instacart. But the people, many of the people who live in that neighborhood, that is their only source of food and I know how painful it must be to be forced to still shop in that store and not have any other option. I'm 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 waiting for an executive at Tops or an executive at Wegmans or an executive at Whole Foods or or even Aldi who will say, Yeah, we wanna we wanna build we wanna build a grocery store on Buffalo's East Side. How do we, you know, how do we lean on these people, on these on these organizations, these corporations to get them to do that? That is a good point And don't hold your breath. I think that one of the things that we've learned is that we can't depend on corporations to take care of us. Right. The African Heritage Food Co-op was promised state funding to make renovations to open up an independently owned grocery store on the east side. And we've not seen very much progress with that. Um, I think that 
community centered and community oriented development is the way to go. We can't depend on a corporation to come in and save our community because they're not invested. I mm-hmm. think that we have enough talent and enough wherewithal to do it ourselves. What we lack is the resources. And, and that's always been the case for, for our community, unfortunately. And, and the issues that we just went through are kind of just part and parcel of generational divestment on Buffalo's east side. True. Very true. You ran as a political outsider and and won the mayoral primary a few years ago. How big a role does local government play in addressing these inequities? And and then to follow that up, what what role does state government play? <laughs> um local government could play a bigger role, right? Mm-hmm. And a, a lot of what I would explain to people is that even when things are not in your purview, right? Even when it's not your job, mm-hmm. you still have a platform, you have influence, you have a network, and you have resources. There are things that could be done in Buffalo that are not sheerly, purely because of a lack of political will. They don't have to. So they just don't. They're right. reelected time and time again, having done nothing to deliver for the residents of neighborhoods and they're still voted in. So there is not an incentive for them to do anything different. Would it be e- as easy as a common council member attaching their name to like the 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 idea of a local co-op? A supermarket or co- co-op market um, in like the Schiller Park neighborhood. Well, I mean, it's not as simple as attaching your name to it, but when you have a name and you call a table together, right? Mm-hmm. When you get with banks who by law are supposed to be making investments into our communities, when you call on foundations, when you call on some of these larger organizations like the Buffalo Urban League and the NAACP, when you call them to the table and you say, we want to work collaboratively to develop a store or housing or whatever initiative it is, and you center the people in that neighborhood who at their block club meetings have been wanting these things and and establishing plans for decades, then that is when you see results. And I think that, you know, some of our leadership has such a linear and myopic view of what can and should be done, right? Like we're spending more time cutting ribbons and, and, you know, Mm. taking photos. Dog and pony show, as you said off Dog and pony show, right? Than actually legislating or even using their platforms as a means to move this community forward. There are are lawsuits going on against the gun manufacturer and certain social media organizations in in regards to the, the top shooting. Do they share some of the blame for what happened on 514? So it's, for me, it's difficult to place a monetary value on 10 precious lives. Mm -hmm. And it's also very easy to shift the blame to gun manufacturers or social media. What we're not talking about enough is this notion of a post-racial America and not facing the issue of white supremacy and of racism and the rise of violent extremism head on, right? How do you teach empathy? How do you teach compassion and humanity? I'm not sure that those things can be taught, but I think that the attack on critical race theory, I think the erasure of the impacts of white supremacy from the center of this, right? We're Mm -hmm. calling it a tragedy. We're not calling it a white supremacist racist massacre. Which, yes, which is exactly what 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 it was, right? Mm -hmm. Um, is Is a part of the problem right now. On the ground level, cause you are, if anything, a community member. I think when when people think of you, when I think of you, I think, yeah, India Walton, 
She's in the community. When I when I'm in the community, I see India Walton. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on the community level, what what progress are you seeing over the last two years? Um, I I think that if not not only five fourteen, but also the winter storm, I think that one thing that's been reinforced for me is that this is a community where we really do care for and care about one another and I mean there there has been you know an increase in direct support services right Mm -hmm. there are more food pantries popping up Um, there was the east side homeowners assistance program that was it was I was actually impressed by that right there was no means testing you went in with your past due water bill and taxes and you know it was forgiven I think that was an, an excellent program I've seen eviction protection programs roll out but all of those things are false solutions, right? Right. What I am looking for are initiatives and policies that get to the root causes of poverty and concentrated disadvantage. And that means increasing home ownership, extending financing to folks to make repairs to their homes, to get them up to code, proactive rental <laughs> inspections so people are not living in dilapidated housing basic infrastructure projects to help improve the conditions in neighborhoods. So while I've, I've seen some progress, I think that we still have a, a very long road ahead. So so then where does where does local government, where do they fit in with this? Is it is it creating new initiatives? Is it building upon initiatives that have worked before? that we're kind of like, we did it once and that was that? You know, I often say the people closest to the problem are closest to the solution, right? You knew that was coming. Yes, yes. I mean, folks have great ideas. There are people who are out here on the ground making things work with very little resources. Like, that's the part that's missing. Mm -hmm. Like, go and talk to the people who are doing the good work and... Support them, they them. Ask them what they need. What was learned between the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and those conversations and the murders, the racist murders at the tops on Jefferson Avenue and the, those conversations that followed? Um, and I asked I asked this because you've been all around the country. You've been to different parts of the world speaking with different people and also like that that period was a was a very important period for you personally did did we as the american public learn anything in that time i think it depends on where you are right in other parts of the country we're seeing police advisory boards being established that actually have teeth. We're seeing community response teams that are actually being effective, that are reducing police response to mental health crises and and sending in, you know, folks who are equipped to handle those situations. And for me in Buffalo, you know, I experienced a lot of frustration and I would say even heartbreak. Um, I think that we gave up too soon. I think that when the is- the mandate was issued for a police reform package from the governor, we accepted very little and there has been no accountability subsequent to the package that was presented at, as what was going to be public mm-hmm. safety reform here in the city of Buffalo. So what do we do moving forward just to get a police advisory board, as you said, with with some teeth, with like, you know, first responders onto the scene of someone with a mental health episode that aren't, you know, law enforcement officers with with guns. Well, I mean, the the first and best thing that we can do is fund the program. Right. Um, Everyone doesn't have a mental health crisis Monday through Friday between the hours of nine to five. Right. Um, (laughs) So, you know, like making sure that the behavioral health team is properly staffed and trained. Right. We know that after 514, there was an incidence where officers after a racist massacre were accosted with 
racial tropes and the commanding officer who said those horrible things to people who were experiencing this tragedy in their own community, there was no accountability. Right. So, you know, they're there on the one hand is making sure that we have funding and staffing. And then on the other hand, it's making sure that the person who we put in these positions to implement these programs are appropriate for the job. Right. <laughs> um, there is, is there concern that we will continue to shout from the mountaintop about the same, these same issues and very little will change? Thomas, we are not screaming from the mountaintops. We are screaming into the void, right? No one is listening, right? As we speak, our council president, Chris Scanlon, is changing the rules so we can no longer speak on items that we file in front of the common council to for them to be put on public record, right? I don't know whether people know it or not, but you know, when an item when an item is received and filed, it goes into legislative purgatory, <laughs> right? Yes, right. It means that we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to discuss it. It just goes away. I think that we are suffering from a problem, a serious issue of lack of political will and lack of civic muscle, right? Yes. The handful of activists and advocates in this community are tired. And, you know, we fight so hard to move the needle in such small increments that it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult to keep up the fight. But, you know, I think the arc is long and mm -hmm. we just have to keep working on building that stamina and bringing in young people. My focus has been on the 18 to 35s because they got it. Right. right. Like right. they they have it. I think they're going to be at the forefront of the next generation of our movements. And that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Are we still very much a, a siloed city? Absolutely. And I can say that because I was once sort of in that sort of nonprofit space, activist space, and now being outside of it and having the ability to interact with people without mm. worrying about whether my job is at risk <laughs> right. is, is, is very different to see it as now an outsider. And I'm, I'm working very hard to try and bridge some of those, those gaps and, you know, just bring people together. I think a big part of what's missing in this city is class consciousness and class solidarity most of us have a lot more in common than mm -hmm. we like to believe. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That is a good point. Another point I wanted to mention is this this resentment from some, some members of the black community on the east side with regards to the Bengali community on the east side. What, what I'm hearing and seeing is that the resentment comes from the Bengali community coming into the East Side and 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 you know starting their own businesses and kind of getting ahead, while some Black community members who have lived in in the community for generations are still feeling the effects of segregation and, and disinvestment in the community. Yeah, let's not be xenophobic, Black people. Mm -hmm. I think that that resentment is misdirected. One important point that I want to make is that a lot of members of the Bengali community have not come here from Bangladesh. Um, they are United States citizens. They're three, four generations in. Mm -hmm. They vote consistently. Um, and, you know, I prefer to approach things from a position of abundance. There is enough for all of us. And I would never want to make anyone else from a different culture feel the way that I feel a lot of times in my own community. Everyone deserves a home. And I feel like if people want to plant roots here in Buffalo and open up grocery stores and build up communities and purchase homes and put them back on the tax rolls, then great. But what we should be focused on is how we build in equity 
for people who have lived in Buffalo, who have survived all of the worst times so that they are able to now enjoy what is being called this so renaissance, for lack of a better term. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, and I, I wanted to I wanted to highlight a positive, a recent positive. But you you push back on that off air. Three point two million dollars for investments along Jefferson Avenue, including one million to help the, the new Buffalo Urban League building. I said there so, seems to be commitment from state and local lawmakers to revitalize Jefferson. But you, you push back a bit on that. Yeah. I mean, if, if you talk to folks who hang out on Jefferson and you ask them, like, where where have investments been made? Because there was a commitment of, of 40 million dollars after 514. Right. Mm-hmm. Ask them where it went. No one seems to know. Right. And the other thing is, like, you know, the Buffalo Urban League does good work. Um, I would like to see the budget. Right. Like, is this going into is this a capital thing that's going into a building that mm-hmm. we won't have access to, right? Is this going toward administration, overhead, and salaries, right? Like, how does $3.2 million get into the pockets and bank accounts and and and, and on the ground level, right? Uh-huh. Um, you know, when you have a CEO of a well-funded organization making six figures, right? And, and you, you form round tables and committees of all of these people. They don't have the same problems as a family who's surviving off $22,000 a year, right? So yes. <laughs> my dream is that we begin to ask that family who's surviving off $22,000 a year, and that's being generous, mm-hmm. what they need and what will best help them rather than continuing to fund and create positions that are dependent upon the continued poverty of of our community. So it's it's, you know, kind of creating like a community table yeah. in a sense with maybe one person from the Urban League with a table of people in that community and hearing their concerns. Is that would that be something that is that what you think of when you, when you talk about this? Each neighborhood in the city of Buffalo should have its own little neighborhood planning board, mm-hmm. right? You bring in non-governmental organizations, nonprofit, and the municipality to develop a plan. They used to they used to do it, right? And it's not enough to invite residents to the table to develop a plan and then sit it on the shelf, right? Right. You have to revisit it, implement it, tweak it, right, and give the people what they ask for and what they need. And it is it is possible. It's a lot of work. Yeah. And we're worth it. Democracy is hard. (laughs) (laughs) And so my last question is it's kind of threefold. Where do we go from here? As I said, as we've been talking about, we're coming up on on two years of this of this, you know, racist massacre that happened on the east side. So where do we go from here? Where does the east side of Buffalo go from here? Where does the city itself go from here? And where does the Western New York region go from here? Yeah, that's a loaded question. My hope for the city, particularly the east side. I think that between 2020 and and 2022, we saw a sliver of light, right? And there was some hope for change. And I hope that those embers stay viable enough for people to want to re-engage in the political process in the policy advocacy space and continue, you know, the mutual aid of, of taking care of one another um, and really just being present and paying attention to what's happening around us. And I try and just stay hopeful, you know. I think that this is a, a great city. We are resilient. Um And I'm almost starting to hate that word because we shouldn't have to be so resilient. We should have leadership that 
cares about us, that is thoughtful, that plans ahead, and that legislates to our benefit. So, but we should take care of each other. We should create a big tent, mm-hmm. invite everyone in, love on each other, and just survive to fight another day. You describe yourself as not a politician, but but what? What was that? What I'm a policy th- person. I'm bad po- at politics. A, po- a policy person. I'm very bad at politics because I like the truth, <laughs> right? <laughs> I like the truth. I like data. I, I like facts. And I like efficacy. And that really doesn't make for a good politician. But I, I think policy is is where it at is it is where it is and I will continue to advocate for policies that benefit working class people here in Buffalo and, and all across the state. One last question. You are gonna be on with Tavis Smiley on five fourteen. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I think is <laughs> I think it's interesting that, you know, three years out from the election, I still seem to be a credible source from Buffalo. Um, <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell Tavis the same thing that, that we talked about today, right? The, my initial reaction was I want to see what happens when the cameras go away. And even though I am an eternal optimist and I, I want to believe the best in people and that folks do the best that they can, we were sold a lot of dreams that we've not yet seen come to pass. I mean, like, they're going to make the Kensington Expressway into a three-quarter mile tunnel instead of restoring Humble Park. I'm, 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 right? Like, everyone yeah. came and they were like, oh, white supremacy and we got to do something about racial this and that. And, and what we get instead is... False solutions, band-aids, ignoring the actual will of the people. And I'm not backing down on that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't want people to say, okay, I've I've been telling myself that you can oppose something without being oppositional. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is not about individual people. Right. Right. This is about a system that has been created to uphold certain conditions in our community and then people get put in positions of power and instead of dismantling that system and creating something that is better for us, they uphold it in order to stay in their position, right? I have a lot more in common with a poor white person than I do a rich black person. That's a fact. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I want us to create a movement of solidarity. And I'm probably rambling now, but I was on Cornell West's Black Policy. Brother West. Roundtable. Yes, Brother West. And one of the brothers on the table said that black people are the only people who consider everyone else in our policy agendas. Right. And I said, first of all, I come from a place of abundance. There's enough for everyone. And to me, being a black, queer, radical feminist is like being a curb cut. Right. You put a cut in the curb. It benefits people in wheelchairs, mothers with strollers, people with mobility issues. It's a good thing. Anything you do that improves my social and economic standing in this world is going to benefit other people automatically, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I want us to focus on that. And I mean, Thomas, I clicked on a social media post today. I think it might've been about that $3.2 million. Right. And in the comments, right? Oh no. Two years ago, it was all choose love. But in the comments, it's like, oh, well, clean up the crime first or they're not Mm going to do anything with it. But but it's still there. The racism in this community is pervasive. And these are not Internet trolls. These are people who are in decision making positions. These are managers and companies. These are nurses who are treating patients in hospitals. Mm -hmm. These are teachers. These are these are our neighbors. These are our neighbors. Right. Like. 
we got a long way to go. We do. We certainly do. You're listening to What's Next, and we're talking about progress and a lack thereof in the two years following the tragedy of 514. I I really want to thank my guest, policy person, (laughs) India Walton, and always welcome guest to this program for being with us. You're listening to WBFO News, a part of Buffalo, Toronto Public Media.